So welcome everyone. As you uh, can probably tell from the backgrounds, this is the, um, this event, this roundtable is taking place as part of the GAP Symposium. And the GAP is a practitioner's guide, which is designed to assist in-house counsel and corporate lawyers and arbitration practitioners with efficiently accessing key insights into a large range of jurisdictions. Um, for the, we started working on the GAP in 2017, published it in 2018. And for the first time in the history of this uh, project, we bring everybody together. And this is the very first session of our symposium. So we're really excited to kick off with um, this round table. And uh, I guess it's very fitting that it's uh, the Belt and Road Initiative because it covers such a broad geographic scope that uh, um, in, in, one, in one sense, it echoes the broad geographic coverage of the guide. Um, to open up the symposium with us today, we have June Bautista and Olga Boltenko. Um, June is counsel in King Spalding Singapore office and a member of the International Arbitration Practice Group of the firm. He has represented clients across a number of industries in international arbitration under various rules, as well as adult proceedings with a particular focus on Asia. Olga practices with Fangda Partners in Hong Kong. She specializes in investment arbitration, has acted as legal counsel in investor state disputes under the auspices of the PCA. Um, as well as tribunal secretary in dozens of commercial disputes. Um, she's an adjunct lecturer at the University of Hong Kong and chairs the ICC Hong Kong Commercial Law and Practice Committee. One thing that her bio doesn't say is um, she unusually is fluent in English, Chinese, Russian, and I'm told also speaks French. Um, <laughs> so, Definitely um, an eminent representative for our panel today. Um, the only thing I'll add is, uh, so I, 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 think, I know some of you around this table, not everyone. Uh, I'm the president of DLOS and um, co-general editor of the guide. And uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to our wonderful co-chairs for today. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, actually, I will be the only co-chair, it seems, for this session as we've had one unexpected panelist uh, dropping out. Uh, he had to attend to something urgent. So my co-chair, um, Olga Boltenko, has kindly um, filled in uh, a very last minute. Um, but she also, before she actually joins the panelists, uh, formally, she still has to introduce several of our speakers as she knows them better than I do. Well, thank, thank you, June. And indeed, it's, um, it's such a great pleasure for me to introduce um, all of the speakers, but in particular, uh, some of them uh, whom I've known for a number of years and worked uh, with on, uh, on many projects in, uh, in the past. I'll start with um, uh, Pak Seti Adi, who um, I've known for um, four, five, if not six years, uh, working on uh, investment and trade matters. Pak Setiadi is an Indonesian lawyer based in Jakarta. He's, um, he's an investment and trade lawyer. He specializes in uh, investor state arbitration and uh, deals with uh, a number of investment related domestic disputes. Um, as well as um, transactional work in uh, Indonesia. And Pak Setiadi, in addition to all of that uh, rather specialized work, he, um, he also works on uh, a number of deals that um, involve Chinese investors in uh, Indonesia. And that's a particular interest for us for this round table because Pak Setiadi would know on the receiving end of uh, Chinese investment, how that investment is structured and what issues uh, Chinese investment would run into in uh, jurisdictions like Indonesia, which is uh, uh, notably part of uh, Belt and Road uh, jurisdiction. So I'm very happy that Pak Setiadi had the time to join us today. I'm looking forward to his interventions. The next uh, participant speaker that I'd like to introduce is uh, Rana Sajjad Ahmad, whom uh, I met uh, last year in uh, Islamabad in, uh, in Pakistan, where, um, as you know, a number of uh, 
uh, Chinese state-owned enterprises are uh, very heavily invested in uh, large infrastructure projects. And those projects um, run into investment protection issues in, uh, in Pakistan to a certain extent. Uh, Rana is um, one of the most notable, I think, arbitration um, and investment and trade lawyers in, uh, in Pakistan. He is the uh, founder and uh, president of the uh, Center for International Investment and Commercial Arbitration in, um, in Pakistan. He's also a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and um, a partner um, in um, Rana Ijaz and partners law firm in uh, Pakistan as well. He's, uh, of course, uh, he has a number of other titles and uh, important positions. Um, for this particular roundtable, um, we're very happy to have Rana because Rana has been involved with uh, Chinese arbitral institutions, with uh, Chinese investment projects, with uh, Belt and Road initiatives in uh, particular for a number of years, from what I understand. And um, as um, you know, a very uh, enthusiastic follower, I know that Rana has been uh, in. Uh, has been visiting China for quite some time um, now, so uh, so it will be very interesting to get Rana's perspective on um, on Belt and Road Initiative and and how it plays out in uh, in Pakistan um, uh, more specifically. And then um, I, I'd uh, in fact I would like to introduce um, um, all of uh, all of you. So I have uh, a lot to say, but um, I have to share my duties with um, with June. So when Julie uh, LaRue joins us from the um, uh, Arbitration Foundation uh, of South Africa, I'll uh, introduce her as well. But in the meantime, June, the, uh, the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you very much, Olga. So I guess I'll start off with um, the person that I've known the longest, actually, in this panel. Uh, that would be Mohit Gogia. So I've known Mohit for about 15 years. Um, so Mohit is actually a partner at SNR Associates in New Delhi, and he's a transactions lawyer. Um, Mohit is also actually a professor of law, uh, and he teaches corporate law at the Jindal Global Law School. Um, Mohit, uh, as I, I've known him for, as I said, for a long time, and he's always impressed me, but I'm very happy to hear that he has been recently recognized as part of Business World's Legal's 40 under 30, uh, 40 under 40 elite list of India's finest lawyers and legal influencers. Um, and he is also a very uh, proud father and a very devoted husband. <laughs> That's Mohit. Um, the next I'd like to turn to is Brad Wang. So Brad, I met when I think he moved to Hong Kong several years ago. Brad is the Deputy Secretary General of SeaTac Hong Kong. Um, SeaTac Hong Kong is the first overseas branch of SeaTac, which is the oldest arbitral institution in China. Um, Brad, as Deputy Secretary General of SeaTac Hong Kong, is in charge of administering cases uh, brought to SeaTac Hong Kong. Next, we've got Aliona. I'm going to try to pronounce it carefully. Bitchivskaya. I don't know if that's yeah. Um, Aliona is counsel at SIAC. I think she's been the apart from Kevin Nash. I think she may be the longest standing SIAC uh, member of the Secretariat. Uh, I actually met Aliona a few years ago in Russia at a conference. Um, I think it was, was it during the St. Petersburg Legal Forum? I believe it was, yeah, it was probably that. Um, so Aliona graduated with an LLM in international business law from NUS. And I guess from NUS, she got a job at SIAC and she's been there ever since. Uh, prior to working at SIEC, uh, Aliona worked at a global financial services provider and completed several internships uh, in international law firms in Europe and in Asia. Aliona is uh, New York qualified. Uh, she is fluent in English, Russian, and Lithuanian. And finally, we have Susan Monroe. Uh, Susan is a partner at Steptoe and Johnson. 
and she has been in China for the last, I mean, for a good number of years now, I believe. Um, she is, I would say, probably um, one of our China specialists, um, at least that's how I know of, of, of Susan. Uh, she is not only involved in arbitrations, she also provides FCPA advice, but as well as uh, corporate advice to um, multinationals going into and exiting China. Um, more importantly, and more relevantly, uh, Susan is a member of or heads the ICC Commission on the Belt and Road Initiative along with Robert Pei. Um, and with that, I think we can kick off. All right, so what exactly is um, the Belt and Road Initiative or what used to be known as the One Belt, One Road um, Initiative? Um, I believe it was sometime in 2013 at some speech that this was actually uh, referred to for the first time. And I mean, I must confess when I heard it then, it was like, okay, what is this? What's the big deal about uh, Belt and Road? Um, it's just some, you know, investment by China in, in several countries that will involve a lot of money. I mean, China's already been doing that. Um, so I guess to start off with is like, what exactly do we mean by Belt and Road projects? Um, for instance, is Huawei's investment in 5G um, networks considered Belt and Road? Or what about TikToks or WeChat's interests in the US, for instance? Is that part of the Belt and Road Initiative? Anybody care to jump in? Well, I know that Susan has um, has um, um, a very important message on this particular um, opening question, uh, with reference to the um, the development plans and, and the uh, policy coordination backed by uh, by China. But I do um, uh, what I'd like to say with respect to that sort of opening question is that um, I think all of us um, have attended more than five and 10 conferences ded dedicated to Belt and Road Initiative starting from 2014, 2015, where um, people got sort of over-conferenced on, on the Belt and Road issue, where you would, at every conference, you'd have a presentation, you know, with big words about uh, facilities, connectivity, unimpeded trade, financial integration, and other aspects of uh, Belt and Road. And you would hear all of this uh, important policy statements, but there would be uh, no difference definition as to what uh, Belt and Road Initiative actually is, apart from um, sort of an ambitious economic development plan, or some critics would call it uh, the Chinese Marshall Plan, um, and a, a title that has been criticized by uh, Chinese academics and uh, practitioners. So uh, but Susan, in, in uh, her position specifically as, um, as an IC, uh, a chair of the ICC's Belt and Road Committee, it would be very interesting to know uh, what uh, specifically you think about what it is. Is this, is this um, uh, um, uh, an economic development plan? Is it a marketing plan by China? Uh, what, what, what do you think about this uh, five elements that are often quoted as uh, part of Belt and Road, including you know, financial integration, unimpeded trade and, um, and others? But what is your view? What is your definition of uh, this initiative? Okay, th thanks, uh, Olga and Jun. Um, I should start by saying that what I'm going to say is not necessarily the view of the ICC, because the ICC doesn't take a view on anything political um, or um, anything that is not related to dispute resolution in, in this respect. Um, but uh, I'll call a bit more on my experience in China. Um, and uh, afterwards, I would also invite Brad to comment. CTAC has put out some very good publications on the Belt and Road, um, which uh, I would encourage people to, to read. Um, I think one of the things that happened from the Belt and Road, having lived um, in China, engaging in legal um, 
service, provision of legal services, including arbitration, before the Belt and Road and afterwards. Because from a practical perspective, there is no difference from a practitioner's perspective. An arbitration is an arbitration. Um, the Belt and Road itself, um, I think it's fair to say, was a policy originally. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about that uh, in a minute, but it's evolved, I believe, into a set of principles rather than a policy. Um, and that's quite interesting. Um, and then as time has gone on um, and the global geopolitical issues and health issues and everything else have overlaid this original policy, uh, which became principles, then we, we see the Belt and Road um, adjusting, um, and adjusting so that um, the Belt and Road becomes something that continues to be relevant. The most um, uh, interesting recent development, of course, is, is the latest um, uh, trade uh, uh, set of trade affiliations, which we will also discuss uh, in this uh, 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 session, I believe. Uh, which uh, um, actually include the Belt and Road in some part and uh, may over, override the, some of the policy initials, initiatives of the Belt and Road. So what are we talking about with the Belt and Road initially? I think in China and in particular within um, state-owned enterprises and the party, um, there's a lot more understanding, the Communist Party, uh, there's a lot more understanding of what the Belt and Road was intended to be as compared with uh, maybe more broadly in China and definitely outside of China. Outside of China, when the Belt and Road began to be a thing, it tended to get treated as a marketing slogan uh, because it sounded like one. Um, and I don't know how many people actually read the policies that were underlying it, which you can find online um, uh, the English translation, um, which I have in front of me now, is the vision and actions on jointly building Silk Road economic belt and 21st century maritime Silk Road. And if you go to that document, um, which I have here, it's a very simple outline of what China was trying to achieve at the outside of the BRI. And it's an extremely neutral um, very uh, non-political, um, friendly uh, document. Uh, it's incredibly idealistic um, when, with the benefit of hindsight. Um, it specifically um, states that the Belt and Road is in line with the purposes and principles of the UN Charter. So it was intended to be a fully fledged international uh, project uh, that conformed with WTO rules, that conformed with any manner of uh, international norms, which now sadly have come into question. So the original um, principles, um, again, this document was fully articulated in 2015, but the, the policy was uh, in circulation before then. Uh, they envisaged a, a sort of harmonious um, uh, outpouring of Chinese funding, of Chinese support to the countries along the Belt and Road um, uh, in, in a, a sort of uh, a mutual way where everybody benefited. Um, and there's no talk about Chinese dominance. Um, there's no talk about uh, military issues. There's no talk about any of those sinister things. Um, which particularly the US has, has uh, uh, decided to pounce on more recently. Um, so what does the Belt and Road mean in China? Um, there is no definition of the Belt and Road in legal terms. Neither is there a list of Belt and Road countries. However, there are many different lists of Belt and Road countries and territories um, that are participating in what we will call the Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI. And there are different numbers and different countries on all those lists. And it's quite, it's quite difficult actually to come up with an authoritative um, uh, list of BRI companies. 
Um, uh, Can I just say, yeah. um, so why isn't there a list? Um, if, if, for instance, you have this policy which was articulated in 2015 by the Chinese government, and as I understand what you're saying, the, the, Chi the Communist Party is the one who probably has the, the most um, understanding as far as what the intent and purpose of the Belt and Road Initiative is. But I just, I mean, I would think that part of that vision would be to at least have some criteria identifying. You know, it's, very, it's, it's, it's very loose. Now, there may be um, unspoken criteria. There may be uh, uh, China has a sort of internal um, system, a naval system, and an external system. So there, there are almost certainly political discussions here internally. But for the world in general, there are very few criteria. And in fact, from the very earliest stage and still, China says literally anyone can be involved in the BRI. Although the original policies were very Euro-Asia centric. And of course, that's what we've seen. Um, and inevitably, um, the, the countries, the territories that have been willing to accept um, the uh, Chinese investment and participate in the BRI tend to have been countries which um, need the investment and which are favorable to China for various reasons. Um, so it's, it's a very, un unlike many policies in China, which are very clearly defined, um, this one is, is very um, sort of amorphous, really. And I think that's deliberate because if China had gone out and said, we are going to provide X amount of investment to this country and this country and this country, but not those countries, that, that's not really a very good look from an international um, uh, policy perspective. Um, to, to, be, uh, to create something that was a lot more fluid and um, it's a very friendly set of policies um, compared with some of the more recent policies that we've seen um, is, is in China's interests. Um, China, when it started this, I'm sure didn't know actually what the result was going to be. They had targeted um, uh, jurisdictions where they wanted to invest. They had um, uh, certain countries that they wanted to support, that they had long-term um, relationships with, Pakistan being one of them. There's a very long-standing um, relation, set of relationships, for example, between China and the Pakistan military, which I'm sure Rana will talk about some more. So they had um, uh, targets, um, but it, it was never intended to be finite and it was never intended to be contra uh, confrontational and hopefully controversial. It was never intended to be controversial. Um, the US has tried to make it controversial recently. I think it's very difficult to do that, however, because China never set up any bright lines. Um, it's very hard to bite, to bite on the Belt and Road because it, it's, it's such an optimistic um, uh, set of policies. Now that said, it is possible, and China, there's been criticism from within China as well, to criticize some of the execution of the Belt and Road projects. And, and China has learned a lot on the way and is adjusting its policies in relation to the future um, Belt and Road, which we can discuss later uh, as a result of what it has learned. But it, it was an idealistic um, uh, initiative to start with. Um, and that, that idealism has actually been repeated. Um, uh, and I think it might, might help just to very briefly summarize um, the principles as opposed to the original policy uh, sure. that were artic articulated um, by a, a senior Communist Party member who, who um, is in the educational structure for the party uh, in 2018. And at that time, people were becoming confused about what is a Belt and Road project and what isn't. And this uh, person who's a professor, Professor Zhao Lei, uh, uh, came out and said, there are projects which are not Belt and Road projects, but are in simple international investment projects. 
And he said, in line with the 2015 policies and everything that had gone before, that in order to be a Belt and Road project, and therefore presumably in order to have a Belt and Road dispute later, uh, the, uh, the project had to comply with the following principles. Uh, the principles are very vague. Uh, the, uh, again, idealistic. The first is to realize common development of enterprises, governments, social organizations, and other institutions in various countries or regions. It's very broad. The second is to promote policy communications uh, uh, to facilitate infrastructure connectivity, to have smooth trade, to have financial connectivity, which is very important to the mainland, and to connect people's hearts. Um, how many international um, <laughs> policies talk about people's hearts? The 2015 um, uh, uh, document actually has a section on people's hearts. Um, and lastly, uh, to be a BRI project, um, the project has to adhere to the principle of exploring new modes of international cooperation and global governance at the uh, level of, of uh, the corporate level, the company level. And only projects that contribute to these principles that I've laid out can truly be deemed BRI projects, according to Professor Zhao Lei. And his thinking has never been um, contradicted as far as I'm aware. Um, although what we do see is, uh, especially in relation to uh, courts and dispute resolution um, institutions, um, we see some statistics which suggest that perhaps they're not adhering to the core principles when they are producing these, uh, this data to describe how successful they are with uh, uh, BRI dispute resolution. It very much looks as if quite a bit of that data is in fact any international dispute, which is not what is intended by the BRI policies and principles. So I'm gonna hand over to Brad because he's uh, nodding. Uh, hopefully he agrees. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. And uh, yes, I, I do agree. And uh, I really, really, really personally, I appreciate the uh, the, the answers uh, you, you just provided. Uh, uh, I agree uh, in a sense that uh, I, I I really like the, the word you chose, uh, the fluidity the fluidity of this uh, of 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 the, this of this um, how to say uh, Belt and Road. Uh, the definition of uh, Belt and Road is uh, fluid. It's not set in stone, uh, and I think there are two types of things in the world. One is which you can give a clear definition, like what is arbitration. I think you can find the answer in multiple textbooks. And the second type of things is something that you can't define, like what is happiness. Uh, it's just it, it, or who is Hamlet. Everyone has a his or her own answer to that. And Belt and Road Initiative is like. <laughs> happiness or harm light in a, in a sense that you can't have a, a, a standalone uh, universal uh, answer to that. But uh, that doesn't mean you can't narrow down to, cert for example, Jun, Jun asked the second question, which is, uh, you, you, you mentioned an example, uh, can Huawei projects being categorized or identified as a, a Belt and Road Initiative uh, project? Uh, for that question, uh, actually, you, you can have simple answers to that because there are equipments or tools to narrow down uh, the, the Belt and Road initiatives. Uh, I think there are several uh, tools and I can summarize. The first is, is it currently, is it within the six economic corridors? Is that, that project happening within that six economic corridors? And the second is that, is, uh, is it about what Olga actually just mentioned, the five key areas? I think Huawei, for example, if Huawei is investing uh, or being invested in building facilities in order to enable connectivity along the Belt and Road corridors, that project might be identified as, as a Belt and Road project. Although we can't make a definition, what is a Belt and Road but object, but that object, uh, but that project Huawei just, we assume, had maybe categorized in that. 
Uh, and uh, there are also several other features uh, which I also quite agree with Susan uh, regarding the definition or, or how do we uh, view Belt and Road. The number one is that actually there's no agreement, specific agreement that each country has signed in order to join in this Belt and Road initi initiative. It is just an initiative. It's not like a multilateral treaties where it, each country has to sign in order to join. There's no sim uh, symbolic or, or momentum of that. As long as certain projects fall into that degree, categories, you, are, you, you can be identified as a Belt and Road country or Belt and Road project owner or holder or investor. So, so it's quite, quite, uh, so, 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 so entrance is not that, not that strict. There's no written on the paper, setting stone uh, signif uh, sig significance or momentum for you to be included in Belt and Road. Uh, the, the second is that actually, it, although uh, people automatically, almost om automatically uh, considers China or think about China once you consider Belt and Road, there's actually no way you can find that China has to be involved in, in each or certain Belt and Road projects. In the six economic corridors, or and if it's about the five key areas, for example, cultural exchange, financial integration, trade and investment, if you do that, even if without China's involvement at all, it can still be identified as a Belt and Road Initiative or project. So, uh, I think China uh, initiated this project, but without uh, uh, without ma making it necessary that China has to be involved uh, in the in the in in, in, in certain projects. And uh, I also quite uh, agree with Susan that uh, th this is also unique in that it is sort of set hope for people's bond with each other. Uh, I think uh, Susan uh, cited a heart-to-heart -heart connection. I think in Hong Kong TDC, uh, we categorize this as uh, promoting people-to-people -people bonds and cooperation. I think uh, to my personal capacity, I, uh, the philosophy, and without trying to make it political, uh, the philosophy of uh, initiating Belt and Road is, uh, the key word is opportunity, is to give more people more countries, more opportunities. So opportunity is the key word in the, in the, in the, in the Belt and Road uh, initiative. Uh, you might think of this as a promotion slogan, but uh, opportunity is actually one of the most frequently cited words when you think about Belt and Road. You think about opportunity and you gain commercial and investment benefit from it. And the philosophy behind it is that once people and people are more involved with trading and connecting with each other, uh, it's good for the uh, economic side. Uh, people get benefit from it, and on the other side, on the other hand, it also reduces risk of uh, tensions otherwhere, uh, uh, elsewhere. For example, political tension, or even other uh, unrest, uh, tension of unrest. So people have disputes, but those disputes are usually uh, they fall into the category of commercial disputes and investment disputes. Uh, so, uh, which, uh, which actually coincides with another uh, chi uh, philosophy uh, posed by Chinese, uh, by Chinese people and government, which is harmonious society in a sense that we do more business with each other uh, under those opportunities. Uh, we get to know each other better and uh, people's hearts connect to each other with better bond and tighter bond that might sort of um, make this society more uh, harmonious. Thank you very much, Brad. Mm -hmm. um, I'd actually like to hear, uh, so we've gotten basically two people who, who've lived and worked in China, uh, I mean, their perspective on BRI. I just wanted to maybe get Pak Sadiadi's take, because I think he was also quite nodding. Is that what, it, are, is that perspective consistent with your understanding of, of Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah, okay, June, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this is quite interesting to see if we're talking about the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, when my, from my point of view and from my experience, when we heard first about the Belt and Road Initiative sometimes in 2013, 
here in Indonesia, we do not know anything about that yet. And at that time, if we see about the vigors of the Chinese investment in Indonesia, it's very low. Even uh, it does not reach uh, 10 biggest investors uh, in Indonesia. Uh, so that uh, we, uh, we, we we also uh, almost never deal with it with Chinese investors uh, in 2013. So. But if you see nowadays in 2019, for example, the last officially the last figures released by the government, China ranks number two in terms of the investment. So it is just above the Japanese uh, Japan investment. It's just only the one a few percents below the Singapore, yeah. and we know that the. Uh, Singapore itself, even though it is the high rank highest investor in Indonesia, uh, we know that many companies set up the companies first in Singapore before they uh, uh, invest in Indonesia. So from the uh, in 2013, we almost do, we 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 almost know nothing about the BRI and what is it all about. Yeah, uh, but we see uh, from 2013 until 2015, the flow of the Chinese investment is uh, starting increasing. And uh, one with the biggest milestone is 2015 when uh, there was a one biggest big project. I think uh, it is one of the biggest infrastructures ever built in Indonesia, which is uh, Jakarta Bandung uh, fast track uh, train, yeah, which involved the uh, 6 billion investments. Yeah which is uh, formed uh, or initiated by a joint venture between the China Railway and the Indonesian state-owned companies, some of the state-owned companies uh, to set up the joint venture, to set up this, uh, this uh, uh, project for the six billions, where I think the 75% of the total project was funded by the China Development Banks. Yeah. But in 2005, uh, by the starting this project, uh, people still do not really, really connect it, that project with the BRI until 2018, when Indonesia officially signed a memorandum of understandings with the China government uh, uh, to really this, uh, to uh, this memorandum of understandings called uh, the promotion, the cooperative of the promotion between government of Indonesia and government of China to promote Belt and Road uh, Initiative and also uh, to promote the global maritime fulcrum fission because of uh, uh, global maritime uh, fulcrum fission is the pro official program of the current Indonesian government uh, to make a view uh, or to revive the Indonesian as a center of the maritime. And this view is to, in some way, is has a, 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 a same interest with the China uh, uh, BRI initiative. Yeah. So in 2018, both countries is officially signed the MOU in order for them to try to jointly to effort and to link each other. What is benefits uh, can be obtained uh, by the two government from these two programs. Yeah. And, and uh, since then in the, a follow-up of this memorandum of standing, uh, Gov both of the government claim that the 2015 project is a BRI project. Yeah? So that uh, 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 from 2018, that we know that uh, in our perspective, that BRI project is that the uh, projects here in Indonesia from Indonesian perspective, which is initiated by both countries, even though the implementation can be done by uh, private sectors or the second companies. Yeah. Because in Indonesia, the policy for building infrastructure, for example, is that uh, there is the state is not directly involved in the development, but only to facilitate. The actual investment was made either by the private sectors or by state-owned uh, companies. Yeah. So this, all of the development uh, is made by the uh, either the private sectors or the state-owned companies. Yeah. So, uh, that is, I think, the, uh, our perspective. So we know uh, uh, from 2018, uh, we know that there are some projects which is initiated by the both government. For example, in the Morowali, uh, when Indonesian private sector, it is not the state-owned companies, and the private sectors from China, I think it's a high-based company, to set up very huge industrial estate uh, dedicated to make a smelters and also to make value-added uh, a project of the 
of the nickels and some of the steels yeah it's covering i think it's almost 1000 hectares uh, of the project yeah and some of them is starting to operating uh, i think it's later this year and some of them is still developing and also there is another project in that area which will intend to dedicate it to produce the electricity battery which all of them is involving the private sectors but this project was actually uh, come to the pictures uh, based on the initial discussion in between the Indonesian government and the Chinese government. Yeah. So uh, there is, I think, the, the, the one of the uh, uh, our perspective here. Yeah. Because other than that project, there are uh, many projects by the Chinese investors, uh, uh, which is uh, initiated by the private investor from China. But we, we it's just only the simple, the normal project here. Yeah. Either it is uh, uh, related to infrastructure or not, but the initiation is is not uh, uh, from the both governments. So I think that is the, the what, what we can say. I think uh, uh, right now uh, on, on based on this my experience. So. Thank you very much, Pat. Um, Rana, I know that uh, as Susan mentioned earlier, China has a lot of ongoing projects infrastructure projects in Pakistan. Now, would you agree with the, the thoughts uh, proposed by um, Susan and Brad on what is a, what are BRI, BRI projects? Is that at least the same? Is that consistent with um, your country's understanding of what a BRI project is? Thank you, June. Uh, for the most part, I do agree with the, with the comments made so far. So, so a broader understanding of Belt and Road is that it's the global north versus the global south. So essentially, what uh, Belt and Road is, it's catering to the needs of the global south. You know, they're also referred to as the poor and forgotten constituency. So, in that sense, you know, the the goals seem fairly lofty and noble, right? To develop infrastructure in countries in the third world, which have, in some senses, been uh, neglected. In Pakistan, this view also holds to a certain extent because um, the way it is pitched uh, or projected in Pakistan is that, you know, uh, this is a game changer for Pakistan, Pakistan's economy. Um, if it's been struggling the past few years, perhaps even longer at times, uh, and, you know, at times the World Bank and the IMF, they used to extend these loans, uh, but they had all these conditions, all these strings attached to them. In the case of China, what you get is easy loans, um, longer repayment time periods, uh, and that too from a from a dear friend, um, all weather friend. Uh, so in that sense, I think um, it goes on very well with the general uh, population of Pakistan. The ordinary Pakistani perceives it as truly a game changer for Pakistan. Um, to um, I think Brad's point about lack of China's involvement. So I think uh, in Pakistan, at least, uh, the Chinese have to be involved, whether it's the SOE uh, or whether it's a private Chinese business for it to be categorized as what we call in Pakistan, the China Pakistan Economic Corridor Project. Um, and my understanding is generally to in, in the BRI, the Chinese at a minimum, they provide the financing um, and the management for a lot of the projects. I think labor generally is optional. That depends on the particular country. But I think for the most part, I think a big draw for a lot of the countries is uh, the financing um, and on such uh, terms. Uh, so, so that holds true for Pakistan as well. Um, but certainly, I think uh, even in terms of the GDP, so um, I think the amounts keep varying, but I think it's about 70 billion USD. Uh, and to put this into context, I think if Pakistan is a $200 billion um, economy, so it's, it's almost one third of Pakistan's GDP, so it's fairly substantial in that sense. Right. And so so just to, just to stick, take a step back, so so what you're saying is that at least in Pakistan, compared to let, let's say the IMF or the World Bank, you, the, the terms that actually the, the Chinese uh, parties are providing is actually more favorable in terms of interest, repayment terms, um, less conditionalities? Yes. Um, so, so, I mean, if you talk about the World Bank, uh, a lot of uh, the measures are austerity driven, right? So they, they want the government to withdraw subsidies, let's say on power generation, right? So that hits the consumers uh, directly. Um, and I think a lot of people view um, the World Bank funding uh, as not being very effective. Um, you know, it's, uh, we've had that for quite a while, a couple of decades now, and they think that, uh, you know, they're not very fruitful. Um, so perhaps they think that, you know, this time it would be different because, uh, you know, they, they think there's uh, the, the, the fact that the terms are easier 
it should be more effective also. And um, but but I think at the same time, um, there, there are some people, there are some skeptics out there as well uh, who are mindful and even wary of, of this debt trap that's uh, been referred to, um, uh, you know, in, in certain cases. Uh, in Pakistan too, there is this concern that, you know, um, the fact that we're getting so much financing, at some point you have to pay that back as well. Um, so regardless of whether the interest rate is 3% or now let's say it's 1.6%, you still have to pay it off at some point. Yes. Um, so, so, so that's a concern. Um, uh, but, but I think for the most part, overall, people think that, you know, it's, it's a price worth paying, uh, and Pakistan doesn't have many, um, choices. And, and as I said that, you know, the best part is our infrastructure, uh, would be developed in the process. And I think, uh, at least in Pakistan, the crown jewel of the CPEC is that the Gawadar port. Uh, which provides China access uh, to um, the Arabian Sea and the Strait of Malacca, where what 60% of the shipping of the world's oil supplies goes through, right? So, so that's very strategic. Uh, and for the longest time, and it's a deep sea port. For the longest time, it wasn't developed. Uh, so the fact that the, uh, you know the C, because of the CPEC investment, it's being developed, that also would benefit Pakistan um, eventually. Thank you very much, uh, Rana. Now, just going. Um, following on that topic um, about debt traps and people, countries being skeptical of, of, of this money from China. Mohit, I know that um, in India, there was some talk at least um, at the beginning that India would be one of those jurisdictions where um, China would be heavily involved. But as, as it happens, as I understand it, that hasn't actually been the case. So what has happened to Pakistan is actually not really happening in, in India. Is that is that correct? Yeah, uh, thanks, Jun. So, you know, let me just put things in a bit of perspective from India's standpoint and how India sees the BRI and Chinese investments generally. Uh, so I think the way the BRI is typically understood in India, like Brad mentioned those six corridors, uh, four of them, a sort of circling India from the northeast and through the uh, you know the uh, sea belt around India. Uh, one is BSIM, which is the Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar corridor, CPEC, like Rana spoke about, uh, MSR, which is the Maritime Silk Road, and the Trans Himalayan Economic Corridor, which is up north from Beijing up to Nepal. So you know that's sort of the traditional. Uh, broad understanding which uh, India, Indian government and people in India generally had that these are projects about connectivity and building infrastructure po uh, projects around those corridors. And uh, you know, even before 2013, when this whole discussion about BRI started, uh, the BS BCIM corridor was in talk much before that. I think discussions around BCIM started somewhere around 90s, uh, and there were no reservations that India or the Indian government around that time had uh, uh, concerning that corridor. I think the concerns which started uh, and the stated position of the Indian government started with some other uh, corridors where India felt that it had uh, uh, you know, more of geopolitical concerns. Uh, and that sort of gave uh, rise to other questions and suspicions, uh, which is where I think India sort of uh, has never openly admitted as being part of uh, the BRI. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, all the discussions about, uh, you know, even the BCIM corridor, which were in talks uh, before 2013 and 2015, got uh, held up uh, for concerns around the other corridors. Uh, so which is, you know, that's sort of the overall understanding about the corridors and the projects around those corridors. But what's happened, uh, you know, between 2015, 16, and early part of 2020, there's been a significant inflow of Chinese investment into India. Now, you won't typically consider these as part of BRI, but you know, I mean, how do you understand BRI has always been a question mark. And I was listening to Susan and Brad earlier, and you know, one of the uh, stated objectives, which one of the professors mentioned was connecting hearts. And if you, you know, broaden that, and if you think about it, all those investments which have happened between 16 and 20, 
right? I mean, it's been upward of six billion US dollars. It's been in companies which are technology startups in India, which have gone on to become unicorn companies of uh, being valued over a billion dollars in India. So a lot of trust was built uh, into the Indian public and Indian companies through those investments coming in from Tencent uh, uh, and financial uh, Steadview. Uh, the biggest uh, phone company in India uh, today is Zaumi. Zaumi sells the maximum number of smartphones in India. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there are uh, car companies, electronic companies who are selling Chinese goods in India. So there is, uh, you know, over the years, been a lot of trust which was building up leading up to 2020. Uh, we get into what's happened since then. But I think that's the other flavor which I thought was also relevant. Uh, and, and on the side, there have been other infrastructure projects over the years where Chinese companies have also participated in India. Uh, but those uh, you know, are not something which uh, have been traditionally understood as BRI or part of those corridors. They'll be in other parts of the country. Thank you for that, Mohit. Um, I think, Julie, are you there? Think Sorry, she... yes, I am here. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, actually, um, Olga, can you introduce Julia? Yes, well, we're, we're very happy to have Julia here, who is a, a registrar at the uh, Arbitration Foundation for Southern Africa. And from Julia, we're hoping to get the perspective on uh, the sort of Belt and Road uh, disputes um, involving uh, Chinese and, um, and African companies and, and uh, large infrastructure projects that are driven by Chinese capital in, um, in Africa in particular. And I think what is uh, very interesting, if Julia perhaps uh, can say a few words on that, is the uh, connection that the Arbitration Foundation has with the uh, China-Africa Joint Arbitration Center that's um, uh, headquartered in Johannesburg. And I think in, um, in China, there's a counterpart in uh, China as well. Uh, once we uh, get to the dispute uh, resolution part of the uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. And I'm sorry, apologize that I, I joined a little bit late. So I didn't hear some of the discussions, but I did catch um, the, the, the later part of the discussions. Um, so this Belt and Road is a very big, a broad concept that the Chinese government has brought up. And in Africa, the um, to support Belt and Road, in Africa, there are also the um, Forum of um, China Africa Cooperation, so uh, as FOCAC. Um, and under that, the FOCAC, um, the, the 54 uh, heads of states of Africa and UN plus China, they decided that um, there are quite a lot of uh, commercial dispute with the increase of the um, foreign investment in Africa by China. So they decided to set up a mechanism to uh, resolve the commercial dispute. And that's how the China-Africa Joint Arbitration Center came into being. So it's actually a product of the FOCAC summit. Um, and that, that task was given to the China Law Society. And the China Law Society at the very beginning just identified the Shanghai International Arbitration Center and um, the, the Arbitration Foundation of Southern Africa to be the first two partners of the KJEC project. And since then, um, we just uh, then expanded to include uh, Beijing International Arbitration Center, Shenzhen Court of International Arbitration, so those three, uh, Shiak, Biak, and the Skia, they are the three partners in China. And then in Africa, it's uh, EFSA, it's ourselves, the Arbitration Foundation of Southern Africa. And it's the uh, Nairobi Center of International Arbitration. And then uh, last year, early last year, we, we had uh, Ohara joining us as a KJEC partner. So currently we have three, um, KJ, uh, I mean, three KJ partners in Africa and three in China, and we have six. 
and the idea is to probably uh, get another one from northern africa so that we will just complete this uh the the mechanism and complete the structure and the partners we are now working on a mechanism where we have a rotating chair so each institution act as a chair for kj project um, for a year and during the year the institution will have the responsibility of um, promoting the, the KJAC and um, to organize a KJAC conference. And obviously this year, because of the COVID-19, uh, we, we can't really organize an in-person um, conference. But this year, BIAC is the chair and they still, they organize the conference together with the China Law Society. And in that conference, we published the KJAC uh, uniform rules. So we have a set of uniform rules that uh, discussed and agreed by all the uh, KJEC partners. And in that set of rules, we 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 borrowed a lot of the, the Chinese arbitration uh, practice and um, their rules and to incorporate with the, the African uh, needs. So that's quite a, a, a innovative set of rules for African parties because um, we have a different uh, a legal um, a jurisdiction. We are kind of like under common law, like in South Africa, we are hybrid. We have uh, common law, we have um, uh, Robin Dutch law, we have African law, we, we're quite hybrid. But in China, the, the civil law, but they, they have a very particular set of uh, Chinese law. But the arbitration law and arbitration practice is also quite different from our uh, arbitration practice. For instance, they they don't have that much of oral uh, hearing. But in, in South Africa, that oral hearing is uh, very important for the parties. So the, the efficiency, the time, the cost are all different um, because of the, the difference in law and in practice. Um, so in the KJEC, uh, in the set of the KJEC rules, um, we combine the Chinese practice and some of our practice. So we have um, a quite a unique set of rules. Um, because that set of rules are only published this year, we have not had um, the, the dispute administered under that set of rules yet. Um, another reason is because when China um, or the Chinese enterprises invest in the projects overseas, they register a, a local subsidiary. So when they register a local subsidiary in South Africa, um, that subsidiary, if there is any dispute, it actually becomes a domestic uh, dispute. So they, they, and also for any set of rules or uh, um, to to work it always take a couple of years because we, we first need to kind of uh, bring it to the attention of the attorneys and then you have to um, train them to understand the set of rules and tell them what's the difference and then maybe they will write the set of rules into the commercial contract and when the dispute then arises uh, from the contract they, they might just come under the set of rules. Uh, so for the time being, as EFSA has been in the market for um, 25 years, we have quite a successful um, domestic commercial arbitration practice, which is not, um, which is, I mean, we started from 1996 and now after 25 years, almost all the attorneys are trained on the EFSA clause. So they, they all try to write the EFSA clause into the commercial contract when they come to the arbitration uh, dispute uh, resolution or arbitration clauses. Um, we also now in the process of bringing them to the EFSA international rules, uh, that's after South Africa has promulgated the International Arbitration Act in 2017, in December 2017. So the international arbitration is also something quite new in South Africa. And um, the KJEC obviously is part of international, but it's very China-Africa focused. 
Um, but that, that is something very unique and we are trying to promote that set of rules and hopefully we can see um, China-Africa dispute being administered under that set of rules soon. Um, I mean, <laughs> so, and I, I sometimes, I actually, I don't know whether we should hope for that or not because we, we kind of hope that there is no dispute and all the contract can go smoothly. We, we did uh, administer some dispute under our international rules. We do have uh, Chinese parties involved and in our commercial um, this, uh, arbitration under the local rules, we, we do have Chinese uh, parties and that's actually the subsidiaries of the, the Chinese, um, big Chinese companies. So yeah, that, that is the situation in South Africa and we, we are, I mean, uh, South Africa has been the biggest trading partner in Africa for China for consecutive nine consecutive years, I think, by now. And um, there are quite a lot of infrastructure and construction uh, projects in Africa, in the whole Africa, um, that is under the Spout and Road uh, initiative. And uh, th there is a, a, a research by Deloitte up to um, 20, 2018. Um, so China is the, the single largest infrastructure funder in Africa, and it funds one in every five infrastructure projects and uh, one in every three construction projects. So, so you, you will see that China investment is, is quite prominent in Africa. Um, that is why we, we think um, in all these commercial uh, deals or maybe they will fall into the, the state investment uh, arbitration or into the commercial arbitration, but there is definitely uh, a need and a trend that um, there will be a mechanism to resolve the, the China-Africa kind of dispute. Another thing that um, you, I would like to mention- just, Sorry, can I just interrupt very quickly? So on that on that topic, so as I understand it, China is is very interested in in investing in South Africa and, and Africa in general. So are these these contracts, these big infrastructure projects, um, what dispute resolution clause do they generally put? Is it CTAC? Is it the South Africa Center? Is it something else? Um. Well, most of the obviously, I'm 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 not quite sure if I I don't see them, but uh, for what I can see and for what uh, we we for what we discuss with the our founding members and the other uh, law firms, um, previously a lot of contract actually in uh, incorporate ICC and LCIA because they they don't first of all they don't maybe they don't know of any trustworthy um, African institution. Um, secondly, to, to, for them to go all the way back to China to choose a Chinese institution is also um, a little bit difficult for the African parties to, to accept. That's why they actually go to uh, Paris and London but they also realize that the cost involved there is very high to arbitrate in, in Paris or London. So we are seeing more and more contracts, sometimes to our surprise, that uh, the, the contracts incorporate an EFSA clause that's for, for ourselves. And sometimes they actually come completely, have nothing to do, there's no party from South Africa, but it's some different African parties and they come to they come to EFSA and they probably realize that the cost will be much lower. And also uh, we, we are trying to uh, promote this KJ clause into any uh, China-Africa related um, disputes, um, which will take a while for it to, to really be saying how many are taking that clause in. So, um, I would like to say previously, it's it's more of London and Paris. It's it's not Africa. It's not China. Julia, I, I've um, I've got a question um, as well. It's uh, it's very valuable information that you're sharing with us. Um, from your point of view, what would be the incentive for Chinese parties 
running large infrastructure projects in uh, South Africa to uh, choose the AFSA um, arbitration clause for the for their contracts. Um, is that a consideration of the uh, ease of enforcement? And if so, do you do you have information as to the enforcement rate of uh, these sorts of commercial awards issued under the AFSA auspices? Or is there anything else that you would uh, potentially use to uh, convince Chinese parties uh, in this Belt and Road uh, project that AFSA would be the you know, mo most cost efficient uh, way for them to resolve their disputes? Yeah, um, I think I think it's uh, what we are trying to persuade, not persuade, but we are trying to sell is KJEC concept. That is because uh, in KJEC project, we will have a, a common panel. So that panel is going to have the Chinese arbitrators, the the the, um, I mean, from each 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 partner is going to nominate panelists into that panel. So that panel is going to consist of panelists from the three Chinese partners and three African uh, partners. And um, obviously, in, in that uh, set of rules, we would encourage maybe like a three arbitrators panel so that um, the Chinese party can obviously feel more comfortable if they have a Chinese arbitrator and a panel. And the African party will, will find an African um, panel, uh, I mean, uh, the, the uh, arbitrator in the in the tribunal and then the the chair we will have a neutral uh panel for the chair the neutral being from other countries maybe europe or you know australia and somehow some of the chinese uh, not all but some of the chinese parties they kind of uh, think africa is one so so even if it's it's a, a South African China uh, dispute, they're probably not feeling hundred percent comfortable with a Kenya arbitrator or with an Egypt arbitrator. They would still think, well, that's African. That's that's not uh, not completely neutral. So we are looking at maybe having a neutral panel as well, so that the chair can be from that neutral panel. Then I think that that is quite an attractive. Um, uh, option for the Chinese uh, investors in Africa to that their fallback position is to have a Chinese arbitrator. And also the set of rules obviously incorporated a lot of Chinese feature of the um, arbitration practice. So when they look at this set of rules, it's also kind of like uh, uh, maybe it's an attraction for them to to have a set of rules that it's not completely foreign and it's not completely like ICC rules or the LCIA rules that's completely different from what they know. Um, I think those are the two features. And um, because China, I mean, South Africa is also a New York Convention uh, signatory in China is as well. And we, we do have quite a lot of uh, enforcement cases in, in South Africa, actually. Um, I'm dealing with one of the CTEC award in in south africa but for a chinese party obviously if they if they have a arbitration in south africa if they have a operation in south africa that's much easier for them to have the dispute resolved in south africa instead of going back to china and um uh, the enforcement as well if it is a, a local domestic arbitration it, it becomes much easier they don't have to uh, invoke those new york convention or the uh, those um, in, into the application uh, for a complete uh, Chinese award. The difficulty that we have here is the the court procedure is completely different from that of China, and we we follow this court procedure that, um, like in my enforcement um, case, the the Chinese party is in, obviously enforcing an award that they they got from a uh, CTEC in one of the provincial uh, office that um, what they have to do is to go through this whole um, South African court application procedure, which is very long for them because it becomes a normal application in South African court. And that application has to be served on the respondent 
the respondent can use any uh, court rule to to raise questions like security for cost, like you know, um, it's uh, against public uh, policy. That they can use all kinds of um, defenses. Uh, yeah, the reasons or the grounds to try and delay that process. And that is very, very frustrating for the Chinese party. And for us to explain to them why it's so long, it's very difficult because it's just basically different jurisdiction and our court rule is just that long winded. And it, it normally takes 12 to 18 months to just get into court just for a, a, a post, even a, a, especially when it's a post. Then, then, then how do you explain to the party when they get a award and you can't enforce it in two years and you know and you still have to spend a lot of legal fee to try and get it enforced so well, yeah that's it <laughs> thank you very much julia i'm going to move to from south africa back to asia well maybe even russia <laughs> aliana can i guess wear two hats so so we heard about um how disputes are being resolved for African projects. Um, Julia mentioned ICC and LCIA, Paris and London being the preferred seats at least for uh, African projects. For SIAC, are they seeing um, BRI disputes? And if so, I mean, are there particular characteristics or features? Like where are the projects um, situated, for instance? Uh, thank you, Jun. Yes, I mean, firstly, I think uh, what all the panelists agree on today is that this particular ambiguity when it comes to categorization, what is a BRI transaction, right? So it leads that there's definitely an ambiguity as to what is categorized as a BRI dispute. And that's the challenge I think which arbitral institutions uh, face when they're trying to answer the question, uh, do you administer BRI disputes? And interestingly, then one last question, would you just look at the, let's say Chinese international disputes, right? Do they have to be in a particular sector, let's say construction? If so, does it have to be a large infrastructure dispute or would a medium or small size qualify, right? Uh, maybe a more important question would even be, what about the so-called indirectly related to BRI? So if I may say the secondary disputes. So everything that gets money uh, fueled in from the BRI investment. So we are talking maritime engineering, shipbuilding, even financing, right? So it's very difficult to come to a particular definition. And before this panel, I was actually quite interested in terms of how do how does one track the BRI investment and whether there's any way, way to quantify it. And I found this very interesting um, Belt and Road Tracker uh, compiled by American uh, a uh, non-profit organization, which I'd like to share. And they actually, interestingly, indicated that there are three aspects which we could look at if we actually want to say whether a particular jurisdiction is having an influx of BRI investment, right? So you can look at the imports from China, foreign direct investment from China, and external debt from China. And following that logic, I actually uh, was quite curious to look. We have two growing jurisdictions, which have become SIC users in the last five years. So Kazakhstan and Russia, who are known to participate in BRI, uh, BRI disputes as well, right? So if one looks at that tracker in Kazakhstan, in 2013, the index of debt to China was 5.9% of uh, Kazakhstan's GDP. In 2017, we are looking at the 12.1% uh, of their GDP being debt to China, meaning there is an influx of money coming in. So naturally, we may expect disputes coming out, right? If one looks at Russia, the upward projection is also seen, not to the same extent, but uh, in 2013, the debt to China was 1.3% of Russia's GDP. And in 2017, it was 2.4% of GDP. So again, there's, those are definitely growing markets for BRI, right? So following that logic, when I look at SIC statistics to answer your question, do we do BRI disputes? So what I can say that in 2018 and 2019, from about 60 jurisdictions, which we had, more than half of them were from BRI countries. So including non-Chinese BRI countries such as Malaysia, Indonesia, South Korea, United Arab Emirates. So they're among our top 10 users, right? 
More importantly, we can look at the increase of the Chinese users among the SIC caseload. Uh, China was always in our top three users for the last 10 years. And there's a very significant, actually a twofold increase in Chinese cases in the last five years. Again, given the difficulty of categorization, uh, it may be difficult to say exactly that those are BRI disputes, but most of them come from the construction and engineering sectors. So chances are they are related to that. Then, and then interestingly, I think even more tellingly so, if one looks at the size of the dispute. So if we go by the traditional definition of BRI dispute being the large infrastructure uh, transaction, in 2017, the highest uh, Chinese dispute we had was 74 million US dollars. Whereas in 2019, uh, our highest Chinese dispute is 250 million US dollars. Again, significant increase, so showing certain trends, right? Another aspect which we could look at if we fall back on the traditional definition of BRI dispute is uh, what about construction disputes at SIC? Have they increased? Have they decreased? Have they remained stable? And there's again, we see quite a, a significant increase. Now out of our case, what about 16% are construction disputes, whereas about five years ago, it was under 10%. And again, more importantly, and more interestingly, uh, in 2017, let's say, the highest sum in dispute which we had for construction was 420 million, whereas in 2019, it's 1.4 billion US dollars, meaning that large disputes are coming in construction sector uh, to SIC. And I think one of the colleagues also uh, touched upon that as to how long it takes for the uh, dispute to mature, right? So if the whole BRI initiative started in 2013, so it would... Uh, uh, take around five years for us to actually see the first disputes coming in. And if we're talking a large uh, scale project, we're even looking at the longer time frame, right? This is why the statistics from around 2019 and 2019 are actually quite telling for arbitral institutions whether those disputes are coming in. And I think maybe, uh, well, last but not least, one should probably ask, so what are the features of the BRI dispute? And those are usually complex, multi-jurisdictional, uh, under multiple laws, right? So there's certain needs that the BRI dispute presents and quite often uh, one uh, would see those type of disputes being consolidated. And that's something that a lot of arbitral institutions offer. So if we track Chinese disputes, which go under consolidation, or if we, if we track the consolidated disputes, uh, the same I can see from SIC statistic, we had a twofold increase in our consolidation disputes. We introduced a consolidation provision in 2016 only. Uh, so it hasn't been that long, but even then there has been a significant growth. And of course, uh, naturally as an Asian arbitral institution, global but Asian, we recognize that uh, there's definitely a need to cater for BRI disputes. And what we have done, and my colleague from CTAC would, um, would confirm that, we have entered into a lot of memorandum of understanding with uh, Chinese arbitration commissions, including CTAC, to promote international arbitration. And more importantly, it's probably to be able to give a menu of choices for BRI disputes when it comes to where they want to arbitrate. But I mean, to, shortly, have we seen an increase in construction disputes? If that's what we qualify as BRI disputes, yes. It's just that the question lies, how do we categorize what is a BRI dispute, what is it? And has SIAC been consciously targeting BRI jurisdictions or BRI projects? Yes, uh, so absolutely. I mean, uh, firstly, China, as I mentioned, has been uh, a longtime user of SIC and it's been a user who trusts us. And we have a lot of cooperation with Chinese users and Chinese institutions. So that work which we have done before continued. And I, if I may borrow from what Susan said, at the end of the day, arbitration is an arbitration, whether it's a BRI arbitration or not. So we have certain marketing initiatives, which we have definitely maintained. And it so just happens that a lot of uh, jurisdictions which we focus on are actually BRI related. And maybe more exotically, uh, well, you recall this meeting in St. Petersburg. So before the whole COVID, uh, there was the Vladivostok Economic Forum, right? Uh, and that's also one of the directions we market for. And interestingly, again, there's been a lot of talk about Chinese investments in Russia. So that I understand a lot of projects potentially in the pipeline. It's just that COVID put quite a stop to, um, to some of the developments. But yes, absolutely, we do target BRI, BRI jurisdictions naturally. 
Thank you very much for that, Aljona. I'd like to go back to Susan then. Um, uh, in, in your role as uh, one of the co-chairs of the ICC Commission on uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, does ICC get a lot of its of quote unquote BRI disputes? Is that something that is in, is that in your radar? Sorry, you're on mute. I think you're on mute. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, I'm speaking here for the Secretariat um, uh, of the ICC. Um, of course, the Commission chairs don't necessarily have the same data that they do. Um, one thing I've been told that is um, notable is that uh, there's been a significant rise in uh, 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 disputes that have gone to the ICC, um, which have one party uh, who is a Chinese party and one party who is based in a BRI jurisdiction. Um, uh, there's been a significant rise. Now, whether or not they are I BRI disputes, um, I, I don't have access to that information. Um, I can give you some interesting statistics. Uh, it seems that in 2019, approximately 46% of parties in arbitration cases handled by the ICC were based in BRI jurisdictions. Um, and approximately 58% of arbitral seats were in BRI jurisdictions. Uh, now the ICC, when it looks at what is a BRI jurisdiction, um, they have a list of approximately 138 countries, which is more than many um, Chinese databases. Um, but I think when they are doing that, they're probably looking at the large number of MOUs um, that uh, Chinese parties have entered into in relation to um, uh, BRI projects. Um, and many of those are public. Um, so overall, I think there's an increasing emphasis um, in the ICC's caseload on BRO, BRI type cases. Um, and, and I think we're all struggling a little bit to um, identify specifically a BRI case. Um, the one thing I would say um, from my perspective, if you look at the very sort of core of the BRI transactions, um, government to government or government to SOEs, um, where you have disputes about funding, about rates of interest and so on, those do not go to arbitration or any form of dispute um, uh, resolution. It, it's done uh, through negotiation on a government to government level. So often I think when we're looking at BRI disputes uh, in inverted commas, we're looking at perhaps the secondary level, um, the, the, uh, the services and products and so on that are being fed into the core projects. Um, and of course, to give a plug for the ICC, they are uniquely placed to handle um, uh, BRI disputes because of their geographic coverage and the huge amount of uh, uh, experience they have already um, in most of those jurisdictions. Um, so, uh, and, and the other obvious thing is that they're a, a, a sort of international global impartial um, uh, institution. They're not, they're not linked to any particular country or set of interests. So I, I think the ICC has a bright future. Um, there are of course resist some resistance to the ICC, for example, from Chinese parties. I'm absolutely certain that the majority of Chinese parties will prefer to go to Brad's um, neck of the woods and go to CETA. And I think overall, we're going to see um, the bulk of uh, the initial uh, disputes going uh, to CTEC. They may not be the big C the big disputes, but um, there have to be an awful lot of CTEC clauses out there. Um, uh, and I think it's interesting, by the way, when we talk about Africa, that the non-CTEC arbitral institutions in China have um, made a play there. Uh, that is the Shanghai International Arbitration Commission, EIAC, the Shenzhen International Arbitration Commission, and so on. So I think I think it's very interesting how how um, the various arbitral institutions are sort of jockeying for position. Um, uh, I don't know if anybody else has any comments. Uh, in well, the actually, I, I be, uh, with that, I actually want to transition now to Brad and get his his okay. views as to CTAC as well as the uh, international Chinese courts. 
So, Thank so you, Brad, Brad, what, what, I mean, do you get a sense of uh, whether or not CTAC is actually the, the preferred um, arbitral institution for BRI disputes, whatever, however we define BRI disputes? Thank you. Uh, I'll try not to make it sound like uh, another advertisement or promotional material or a uh, biased uh, opinion. Um, let me let me get this way. Uh, to, to start with, uh, I, I did have find some data, uh, which is in 2018 for CTAC, we had 73 cases involving 23 Belt and Road jurisdiction uh, parties. So that's 2018. So that's the data I found. So data is neutral. So, so I'll start with the data. And uh, secondly, uh, I, I, I do find, uh, personally, I do find a preference of Chinese companies using CTAC. Uh, prof, I think the reasons are so varied um, and uh, so different from each other. For one example, uh, um, for those people who are of my age, which I will not disclose, uh, if they are from China, uh, when they pass the Chinese uh, bar, when they try to do that law entrance examination, uh, they have to uh, study arbitration for a while because they take up about three points out of 600 points. So uh, and that three points of arbitration is one of those easier, e easiest uh, pointers. And uh, for that, you need to learn about CTAC. So every qualified Chinese lawyer already have been very well familiar with uh, CTAC arbitration institution and its arbitration rules and how to set aside uh, fingers crossed, how to set aside CTAC award. Uh, so, so familiarity, that's one of the reasons, not because they think, oh, it's CTAC, I will get my company uh, resolved, uh, disputes resolved on their own turf. That might be what they perceive, and I, I have no intention of uh, changing people's perception, because that's not something that we would like to do or we can do. Uh, but uh, most of them, they chose CTAC. One of the reasons is about the familiarity. Uh, then they, they feel that they understand CTAC, uh, how they work. That's from Chinese uh, lawyers' perspective. One of the reasons, among many other reasons. Uh, another, another, uh, another aspect I like to uh, brought to you with today is that mm, I want to show you a, a story of how actually CTAC, uh, uh, how, what effort we have made in order to attract uh, BI. BRI disputes to come to us. Uh, and Susan has actually mentioned that uh, very kindly that we have uh, e uh, published several uh, mm, several publishments. Uh, one is about, uh, one is for the Chinese parties, which is about the, a general study of, uh, of laws along the Belt and Road jurisdictions because they vary from each other and quite, quite different from each other. So that's for Chinese parties. And the second publication is about CTAC award in relation to Belt and Road arbitration. We actually published, publicized several arbitral awards, uh, quite, quite a few, uh, quite a number of arbitral awards in English, uh, redacted awards, of course, uh, to the international parties as well. So that's one example uh, we have uh, about what we have done for Belt and Road parties. Uh, last but not least, actually, what I want to emphasize the most is I want to go back to one of the keywords I said today, is, which is about trust. I think for, for us, we want to uh, create a trustworthy environment for both Chinese parties and international parties. And that's why uh, for CTAC panel of arbitrators, uh, that is a panel of arbitrators we renew every three years. And uh, a lot of, uh, uh, we, I personally got a lot of complaints from uh, US lawyers and UK lawyers about their failure to be enrolled uh, in 2017, no, 2014, I believe, yes, 2014, and they didn't get listed uh, in the term of 2014 and 2017. And they asked why. Uh, one of uh, the reasons uh, for that is actually for that uh, term renewal, we focused a lot on spreading our uh, in renewal message to those Belt and Road jurisdictions. We actually pull a lot of strings to those local embassies that we have at Belt and Road jurisdictions in order to attract some arbitrators that Belt and Road jurisdiction, uh, those Belt and Road jurisdictions have in order to have them uh, be listed on CTAC panel. 
and we didn't actually in, 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 in enroll too many new UK or US lawyers, which we already have uh, quite a few. Uh, because we, we understand that uh, there's a cultural, um, it may come from a, dis a cultural aspect, which is that for, for us to negotiate, we don't want to take a dominant side. We, we, we always say win-win situation, win-win benefit, and we want to respect each other. And that's something uh, we also find important in arbitration. We want the, 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 the arbitration tribunal comprised of a balanced group of arbitrators that respect both sides of the parties and understand both sides of the party. And that's something, if we are talking about values, that's something we have uh, value, take values of. So we, 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 we really made a lot of efforts to, to reach to those countries and include those arbitrators in our panel. And uh, uh, so without uh, promoting our institution too, too much, which I, I hate to do that, to be honest. And uh, uh, CTAC actually knows that I'm not very good at promoter of CTAC. I don't bring a lot of numbers in cases. I beg to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, but, but, but uh, deeply, I personally, uh, and I, I use that word heart to heart, I do believe that uh, 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 from uh, our philosophy is that we, we need to have uh, people that gets to understand two sides. So, so, so that's something we, we have been doing. And uh, so for, for that, as one of the reasons I still have very high hope for CTAC to uh, embrace more and more cases in the future in terms of BNR, uh, BRI disputes. Thank you, Brad. I, I, I know Aliana just wanted to raise a point that she forgot to mention. Uh, just actually very quickly in response to what uh, uh, Brad was talking about, I think one of the aspects when parties are choosing a particular dispute resolution mechanism uh, may happen to be language and more particularly Chinese. Because from our experience at SIC, we do have a lot of Chinese disputes being run bilingually. So of course not by me, but by my Chinese and uh, Singaporean uh, colleagues. So when it comes to a particular uh, choice for a BRI dispute, if you have a Chinese counterparty, chances are they may be more comfortable with an arbitral institution or a court for that matter, who can actually provide that for that particular need. Thank you. Um, what about Olga, I know you have, a, but I think a question for Pak Setiadi. Well, yes, and that's uh, picking up on the discussion about the preference that Chinese parties have for CATAC and uh, Chinese language arbitrations and some sort of familiarity that Chinese parties would have with the arbitral process that would then inform their preferences. Um, Pak Setiadi is a transactional lawyer and, and somebody who um, has been involved with a number of Chinese uh, projects in uh, Indonesia. What sort of dispute resolution clauses do you see in, um, in these transactional documents and, and, and how are these disputes resolved uh, with respect to Indonesian projects. I know that there's a large Chinese population in uh, Indonesia, so I would imagine language wouldn't be an issue, but would those disputes end up in uh, domestic courts in Indonesia? Would, be there, would there be a preference for an arbitral institution such as um, um, SAAC or uh, CIRTAC or maybe the HKAC as well? Or would you see those going more towards um, investor state arbitrations where Chinese investors would uh, take the courage and, um, and, and um, um, start claiming their lost investment uh, using investor state dispute settlement mechanism. Okay, thank you, Olga. I would like to uh, share this, my experience so far in dealing with the Chinese investors. In my experience, there are uh, two types of the Chinese investors. First is that those uh, categorized as uh, sophisticated investors, yeah, which coming from normally from the big uh, Chinese companies, uh, private sectors, or it is state owned enterprises, Chinese state owned enterprises. And then the second category is from the small and medium, because there are numbers of a uh, lot of uh, uh, Chinese small and medium investors also investing in Indonesia. And uh, to me, they uh, have uh, different behaviors with regard to the uh, dispute resolutions when, when dealing with uh, their partners in Indonesia. And first is that uh, for the uh, small and medium enterprises, it seems that uh, they do not 
really, really uh, care about this uh, issue of the dispute resolution. And uh, normally they just follow the advisor from the, the advisor is any, or if they are, uh, if, if, if they have uh, quite good partners in Indonesia, uh, uh, they, they basically only want to be that the dispute uh, would be settled in the natural countries or wherever the natural countries, it doesn't matter as long as it's not Indonesia, it's not in China. Okay, but uh, in this matter, this Hong Kong is not considered as a natural from the Indonesian point of view because of because of this. Even though we know that uh, Hong Kong is different than China with regard to the arbitration regime, but from many Indonesian companies, Indonesian businessmen, Hong Kong is same with China. So when we're talking about the natural dispute resolution forum, it's always referred that not the forum in Indonesia or in China or Hong Kong, and. and it's a very, 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 very broad. Yeah, but normally the choices are are either the ICC or the SIC. It's narrowed down into the two institutions. Uh, this is for the uh, small medium. But for the uh, uh, for the big companies, uh, uh, they have known from the beginning that Indonesian partners definitely would like to have a natural forums. Yeah, and in most of the documents which is proposed by the uh, Chinese companies is always mentioned about the natural forum, which is also not Indonesia, not the China or the Hong Kong here. Yeah. And, 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 and it also uh, refers to two very, very popular different resolution, which is ICC and the SIC. Yeah. Even though uh, there was some exception uh, where uh, finally the parties agrees on this uh, uh, SIC, for example, but uh, we see that it is very, very small exceptions here. Yeah. And in particular, if it is uh, dealing with, uh, with some of the specific issues, for example, uh, issue of the uh, shipping and, and uh, as, as far as my experience, the shipping things, yeah. yeah. And, and that is the, the uh, in terms of the distribution clause close uh, uh, included in the, in the project or in the documentation. But for the loan agreements, yeah, because there are numbers of the Chinese companies uh, extended loans to Indonesian uh, uh, joint ventures, yeah, like what I mentioned earlier in the project of the uh, high-speed rail Jakarta Bandung of this almost six billion dollars. Interestingly, is that it is not referring to the arbitration, but as far as I remember, it's referred to the resolution to the court in, if I'm not mistaken, in Hong in you know, in London, I think. So. Uh, so they even do not choose any arbitration at all in this in 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 this loan documentation. Thank, thank you very yeah. much for that. But, um, I'd like to actually ask the same question to both um, Mohit and probably then finish off with Rana because I think Rana would, can wear two hats. Um, so Mohit, for Indian, um, for the Chinese investments in India, where do you see the, at least from your experience, when you look at the these contracts, where are how are these disputes being at least proposed to be resolved? Is it courts in India, arbitration, and in where? I think most foreign investors, when they invest into India, China and Chinese companies and investors being no exception, they prefer to stay out of the Indian court system as much as they can. So unless they are really forced to. Uh, you know, it's going to be a last resort for them. So most foreign investors uh, prefer a neutral international arbitration venue. Uh, with Chinese investors in particular, uh, like, uh, um, I think, uh, you know, I guess the same concern that Indonesians have, even for Indians, Hong Kong and uh, CTEC never becomes an option because it's never considered uh, as a neutral venue. Mm -hmm. um, the most, the two most favored ones are uh, Singapore and SIAC and uh, London and LCIA. Uh, and I think what tilts one over the other is uh, uh, whether there is, whether the Chinese company uh, or the foreign investor has proximity to either of the two. Uh, and then, you know, the Indian party would prefer the other one uh, and costs, uh, uh, you know, uh, particularly uh, if the Indian, uh, if it's an Indian smaller company, not, you know, a big, uh, global Indian company, then they would prefer Singapore for costs over a London 
uh, and then ICC comes in as a, as third as a third option if uh, you know if the first two don't work out. Uh, but you know, I mean, dispute resolution when it comes to uh, uh, you know dealing with Indian companies, a lot of times uh, foreign investors find that uh, when they are dealing with Indian parties, it's you know uh, it's 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 not necessarily. Uh, the, uh, that arbitration is the first call of trying to settle disputes. There is, you know, a consultation process before that, and they would try to, uh, you know, see if they can get any recourse on that. Because the experience has been that even in arbitration and even with neutral arbitration venues, um, uh, if they eventually need to come to India and enforce that foreign award into India, they need to go to a court in India. Uh, it's not that if uh, CIAC or LCIA has passed an arbitration order, that is, you can automatically take that uh, on the ground to local authorities and ask them to uh, enforce that order. Uh, if the other side is not complying, you need to go to a court in India uh, and get an order from that court. And, uh, you know, that could take some time. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, but there are obviously, uh, you know, if there is a dispute, it needs to be resolved. And, uh, in those scenarios, CIAC uh, has traditionally been the most favored, followed by LCIA and then ICC. Oh, thank you very much for that, um, Mohit. I'm sure Aliono is quite pleased to hear that. <laughs> and also, I guess, as Susan, there's no representative from LCIA here. So, um, um, what about you, Rana? What do you see is the preferred mode of dispute resolution in, in Pakistan? Um, and I guess this, uh, a sec second question to you is what is, the, what is your center doing to promote or attract um, BRI disputes to your center? So, so I'm going to wear two hats here. Um, so based on my experience, I think for the most part, the disputes are resolved amicably. This might be a bit surprising. Um, so, so I'll give you the example of my center. So in the past couple of months, we were contacted uh, by a Pakistani, uh, two different Pakistani engineering companies regarding a dispute with the Chinese entity. Uh, so they had uh, written the SICA model clause into their contracts. And then eventually we were informed that uh, this dispute was uh, amicably resolved, um, which is of course great for the parties. Uh, as a practitioner, um, so I think it sort of runs the gamut. It's, it's hard to put my finger on one preferred method. So uh, it might be surprising to hear, but in some cases, um, even the domestic arbitration um, clause has been stipulated in some contexts, which of course is surprising because why would a Chinese party want to arbitrate a dispute within Pakistan um, pursuant to Pakistan's domestic arbitration law? I think, the, I think the reason for that is, as I mentioned earlier, I think a lot of the disputes are resolved amicably. And I think in, in, in those cases, Chinese investors, frankly, don't give too much attention to how it would be resolved because they, they are you know, quite confident that eventually they would have it resolved. So if it's a large powerful SOE, they know uh, they, they can um, you know, call some people, figure out a way to resolve this in an amicable way. If it's a smaller investor, again, I think they prefer method is resolved amicably because yeah, I, I don't see a lot of Chinese parties going to Pakistani courts. Uh, I think it's similar to how things are in India because I think they're wary of the local court system. But I think um, in terms of arbitration, um, yeah, I, I don't think they have a particular preference, but I think if I had to name one particular institution, I think uh, it would probably be uh, SAAC, um, CIAC, uh, where they would prefer to go. Uh, but in terms of what our center has done to promote, so, so last year uh, I was in Beijing and we actually entered into a cooperation agreement with CTAC. Uh, the idea basically was that we promote both centers um, with the focus on the CPEC framework. Um, and um, so, 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 yeah, that's something we have done. But yeah, we have no experience yet of uh, administering any BRI disputes. Well, thank you very much for that. Olga, did you have a final question for? The panel. Well, uh, yes, and that's moving on from uh, um, strictly speaking dispute resolution um, um, issues and moving more towards uh, transactional issues and the perception that the Chinese investors have in uh, the Belt and Road jurisdictions where they go and invest. You would have, I'm sure, you would have all seen all of these publications in uh, in mass media. Um, calling Belt and Road Initiative China's Marshall Plan, 
and then um, um, basing all of this, you know, issues relating to that trap um, project finance situation where Chinese investors would go in in countries like uh, Sri Lanka or Indonesia or in many of the African jurisdictions and and um, and invest and and take equity in uh, strategic projects, infrastructure projects in uh, in those countries and uh, utilize the debt. Uh, in order to advance their own their own agendas. So, um, given that um, th um, this is a round table, I I'd like to seek uh, your views on on uh, on this particular um, allegation that's leveled against um, uh, Chinese uh, investors and Belt and Road Initiative as a whole. And perhaps I'd, I'll I'll, um, I'll start with. Um, if I may, with uh, um, uh, Baksetiadi, and then we, we could uh, we could move on to uh, Mohit and and Rana and your views on uh, on that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the debt trap issues is also uh, has been here since the uh, first launch of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, yeah. and uh, many many scholars also criticize uh, this this this. And, and, and also, other than criticize, also warns uh, the government to, to be aware of these issues uh, when, when there is a lot of uh, investment in Indonesia. But so far, is, uh, from my personal perspective, uh, it is not that, that things. Yeah. Because uh, in Indonesia, there is a policy where, uh, that the project promoted by government, whether it is uh, in the framework of the PRI or not, uh, the one principle is this, the project is must be feasible. Mean the feasible means uh, it can be survived and financing itself and also can be repaid back uh, whatever the loan they require. And normally the government restricts the, uh, 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 the, the structures of investment by way of the uh, debt to equity ratio, where for in, in general, uh, the debt to equity ratio lot by the government is one to three to, or to four for the normal project and one to seven until 10 when it is the large infrastructure project here. So with that uh, restrictions, uh, I think uh, it can be prevented that the projects can be collapsed because it is really, really can serve uh, the debt uh, from the income from this project itself. Uh, there are some exceptions, for example, where in the high-speed rail project, the, the project is delayed and it is increasing the cost here. But uh, I think the final one is that the, the final result is that there is an extension of the loan here. So uh, with regard of the uh, debt trap issues, I don't think so that uh, it is uh, 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 that, that, that what the people think here. And, and I would agree that uh, uh, if every project must be seen differently and it must be evaluated so that the project, the project is become uh, the feasible in order for them to serve as a, as a, as a project finance. Yeah. And uh, also in Indonesia, the, there is a policy of the government that uh, in the whatever project, uh, even though it is a big scale project and is supported by the government, government will not issue any guarantee yeah, for that project. Yeah. So it is purely a business to business relationship in between uh, the partners of the investment and also the banks. Yeah. So at the end of the day, uh, uh, there is a become a commercial issue. So. Thank I you. Think that is, yeah. Yeah. I think that is Well, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and perhaps um, mass media is, is being, um, um, is trying at least to be sensational here. But Mohit, what, what do you think about that? What, as a transactional lawyer, do you see any particular um, um, aspect of China related transactions that would? Uh, Create and the so-called debt trap, and and then take equity over the uh, existing projects. So, uh, let me try to answer it uh, in two parts. Uh, first, I'll talk about uh, you know the debt trap and India's sovereign concerns. I think you know the concerns really in India have been more sovereign and geopolitical rather than debt trap uh, on the face of it, at least on the BRI scheme of things. Uh, uh, but you know, India is also a regulated uh, economy, and there are regulations which govern uh, the use of debt by Indian companies. Uh, equity has traditionally been more favored and more welcoming rather than debt uh, uh, in uh, you know as a means of financing in India. 
and a lot of sectors other than a few strategic sectors are uh, open as automatic investment uh, options for foreign investors, including um, you know companies from China, which they used previously. Now, but you know, I mean, when you see all these uh, commentaries being written all over the world, and if an if a government needs to sort of rely on and pinpoint and pick up issues, they would, right? So that's what uh, I've seen uh, the Indian government's position, at least this Indian government's position. Uh, it may change where, if there's a change in government, but uh, the stated position uh, in India has been uh, that there are concerns around transparency, there are concerns around debt. Uh, uh, you know, we don't uh, really know how it all fits in. Uh, whether the projects which are being proposed will be viable or not. So all of those have been uh, stated concerns of uh, the Indian government. Uh, having said that, I mean, you know, there are uh, infrastructure projects also, which uh, uh, Chinese companies are currently undertaking. Like, for example, there's a big metro rail project in Mumbai, uh, which is being constructed by Chinese companies. And it's been uh, financed by the new development bank uh, NDB, which is a consortium of the BRICS countries. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are all those projects going on at the side as well. Uh, but, you know, I mean, that's sort of the one angle and one side of the story. The other is on the private investment sides and how uh, things have panned out uh, in this 2020. Uh, you know, beginning of, the, uh, uh, of this chat, I was mentioning how, uh, you know, trust has been building over the last few years with the increase in Chinese investments in India. Uh, but you know, 2020 has been a different and an odd year, and uh, uh, you know, COVID of course is one thing which we've seen globally. But there have been also other concerns, and there have been some, uh, you know, quite a few protectionist measures which have been taken now by the Indian government. Uh, uh, you know, which uh, haven't been, you know, don't have a stated policy against China, but uh, you know, it's clearly directed towards one country. Like for example, in April of this year. Uh, there was a new press note which was announced by the Indian government which said that investments from countries sharing land border uh, with India or where beneficial ownership uh, is from such countries are not permitted without government approval. Now, this is not just for sectors which are strategic. This covers everything. So even countries which have uh, company, Chinese companies which had current operations in India were kind of stuck because of this rule. And, you know, there are over 100 proposal right now currently within the Indian government since this proposal came out and none of them have been approved. So that's you know the other side. And then on the infrastructure side in July, the Indian government announced that uh, uh, they imposed curbs on Chinese uh, companies for bidding uh, uh, in government infrastructure projects. So that sort of takes away you know the bigger uh, BRI or the infrastructure government to government projects. So, you know, that's sort of where India is currently in the position. And, you know, it's, it, 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 it's a sad situation because things were really moving up, uh, you know, before this year. And we've now reached at a stage where, uh, you know, we're all uh, looking inwards and, you know, closing doors towards our neighbors. You know, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful that things will now uh, start moving back to uh, where they were. But uh, until that happens, we are sort of, in a position where everybody's stuck and uh, a lot of projects are suffering because of that. Right, thank you, Mohit. That's, uh, that's truly 2020 has been a difficult year for Chinese Indian investment. And there's hope that uh, things will pick up later on. Rana, um, what is the situation in uh, Pakistan? Yeah, so I briefly referred to this at the outset as well. So there are some concerns about the debt trap, but I think uh, those voices are very few. Not a lot of people are skeptical. Uh, and I think, in my opinion, they're misplaced as well because, you know, remember, Pakistan has been getting loans from the World Bank, the IMF, for a long time. So, I mean, so debt financing is something our country is used to. And uh, I don't know, fortunately, unfortunately, we're also used to debt uh, uh, rescheduling and restructuring as well. So, if it comes to that, I think uh, we have a good enough relationship with the Chinese to have those rescheduled. Uh, so, that should not be a problem. And, and I think an important point here is that I think the, the way the Belt and Road has been conceived. I think that the Chinese are smarter than that. It's not just bricks and mortar. I think they've thought beyond that. They understand the importance of culture, the so-called soft power. And I think uh, that is something uh, that will allay the concerns of a lot of people as well. Thank you very much for that, Rana. Um, 
I see that we're almost out of time. And I'm also conscious that we've got another panel uh, that starts at six. So on behalf of Delos, I would like to thank everybody who participated on this panel. Uh, also my co-chair, co-moderator slash panelist, Olga, who had to switch uh, hats as well, um, short notice. Um, as we mentioned in the email, we'll send you the, the draft um, summary slash report of this session so that we can get your feedback. Um, we don't want to obviously attribute anything that you're not comfortable with, or we don't want to misquote you. Um, so we'll try to send that across as soon as possible. Thank you very much again, and have a wonderful evening or afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone.